services um, that we shared during this time of lockdown and as uh, lockdown looks to be coming towards its end now thank goodness um, we hope we pray um, then uh, thank you for your for your faithfulness during this time today um, as well as uh, looking at a particular Bible passage um, so you need your Bible if you, if you happen to have it to hand um, you'll also uh, need some bread if you've managed to get some uh, some fruit of some sort um, I managed to, I couldn't get grapes anywhere this week, but I managed to get some, uh, some cherries and uh, something to drink, a glass of water, a glass of juice or whatever, because we're going to be sharing um, a little bit later an agape meal together. Um, very simple. If you haven't got anything, join in with what we're doing here, but if you have um, and you can scurry around, I'll give you a couple of minutes to do that, like I try to do each week. I'll do a bit of a recap and we'll, uh, we'll come together in a moment. So. Um, 
let's just look what we've been what we've been looking at over these weeks. Um, if we go to that, oh, oh, my, I've got Mike with me. He's so on it. Um, I love him. Uh, he's been so kind and so giving up so much time. I think he's, he says he's met, he says himself he's been to church more times in these this time of lockdown than he's been to church for a long time. So thanks, Mike. So let's begin. First week after Trinity, we looked at the story of Acts chapter 10 and Peter and Cornelius. Peter gets all the limelight, but I think a lot of Cornelius too, because both had to embrace something beyond themselves as they looked to a new world. And of course, that's very pertinent at the moment. And uh, yeah, both uh, men uh, listened to the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit inspired them to dream a bigger dream. Next one, please, Mike. The second week of, uh, of Trinity, we looked at how the Holy Spirit seems to have this incredible way of speaking through the whole of history. That's because the whole of history, the, the Holy Spirit's been there. And so our scriptures um, are, have this golden thread of the Holy Spirit running through that. We'll come back to that a bit later today. But we looked at how the tabernacle, the tent of meeting in the time of Moses, could relate 1,500 years later to the person of Jesus and the great seven I am sayings in John's Gospel. And um, I don't know whether you've joined us for that week, but for me personally, um, that was news to me, and, and it blew me away. Um, and uh, I've tried to do a bit more research about that during this time. And then, um, next one please, you Go part, I think I've got slightly long order. We'll have to go back to the, the candle in a minute. But last week we looked at the uh, story of the stump of Jesse in Isaiah chapter 11 and 12. At first, it doesn't seem the most uh, inspiring of all stories, um, but it has some beautiful words that we often use at a carol service. And what does that say to us? Next one, please, mate. Um, we, look, we looked at how the Holy Spirit rested upon Jesus and indeed inspired him to be the person that he could be. And in that sense, the Holy Spirit calls us to walk in the same footsteps of Jesus. Secondly, the Holy Spirit inspires to heal. If you remember Ephraim and, Ju and Judah, the, two, the northern and southern kingdom, needed to be healed of a long-standing rift that was between them. And Isaiah beautifully gives the image of the wolf lying down with the lamb and the leopard with the calf. Beautiful, beautiful images. And then we looked at how the Holy Spirit is strangely in the shape of a tree in, the, in this passage from Isaiah. And it took almost as if it prophesied the cross that it was found as a banner. And the cross then is the place of meeting of pain and love for the world. I was only having that conversation with somebody yesterday, saying, how do, you, how do you help somebody who, when you say you believe in a loving God, how do you help them to, to try to work through the issue of, of suffering? How can there be such suffering in the world if there's such a loving God? And um, the only answer I've ever come up with is, is the, the, the rough wood of a cross, not even a nice smooth cross or one of those holding crosses, beautiful though they are, it needs to be rough, it needs to even have splinters. I remember a, a, an amazing chaplain in a hospital who, who gave somebody who was really hurting a, a cross with splinters in it deliberately and said, hold that. Now, that doesn't mean we still understand, it just means that we have a God with us who walks that journey with us. Amazing, wonderful. And then we looked at um, Isaiah chapter 12, and we looked at the whole idea of praise and worship, even when we're hurting, even in times of lockdown, how good that is. So, before we go on to this week, I'm going to have to ask my friend, I've got my slides just slightly out of order, isn't it? I was, he's got back to it. He's shaking his head at me. So we're going to light our candle as we share and our worship today. Hopefully you've had a chance while I've been talking to go and get a piece of bread from the bread bin or something else if you can. Um, hopefully a glass of water at least and an orange, an apple, a grape, whatever you manage to get together for our agape service in a bit. But we light our candle together. 
because we're in the presence of the living God and in the power of the Spirit as we meet and worship Him all in our different homes, all in different places, but as we worship today. So let us, let us pray together. We just focus on being with Him, with one another, and with Him being with us as we spend this time together now. reminds us that Jesus is with us. And so we pray. As we share our time of worship this day, may your word be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path, now and always. Amen. this week, Mike. This week we're going to look at how the Holy Spirit um, inspires us through Scripture, and particularly we're going to look at Mark chapter 1. Um, we've had two of this week's video blogs during the week have been from Mark chapter 1, and I suppose that's what gave me the inspiration for wanting to explore this, and then what I, I found was that the, 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 the whole of Mark chapter 1, the beginning of Mark's Gospel, is is full of the, the, the inspiration of the Spirit um, in so many ways. We're going to look at that a little bit together today. Um, but it then provides us with a blueprint for what it means to be church as we move forward together from um, where we are, as meeting in church in lockdown, to becoming a church physically as well as uh, spiritually in this time. I can put the next one up, please. Thank you. I want to talk to you about how we read our Bibles. We all hopefully have the Bible, whether a physical Bible in our hands or a Bible on our computer, on our, our iPads or computers or phones. It's amazing how we can get hold of them now these days. And one of the things is we can we can read our Bible. We can read it as part of, um, say, morning prayer or, or uh, part of our doing our prayer diary each day. And strangely, it, can, it, we can, it, it is holy in, in a good sense of the word. It's like something precious. People often look after their Bibles for years. And, um, and I get that, but they have family Bibles that have been handed down from generation to generation. What is it like then to take a highlighter pen and start to highlight particular phrases or particular passages or particular words even that mean a lot to you as you read them. Now you may say that, well that's, that's terrible, you could never do that to your Bible. But one of the interesting things is, it's one thing to read, but as we then wrestle with Scripture, a bit like Jacob wrestling with God right the way back in Genesis, but actually it goes deeper. And I know one person particularly um, who, if she, if she was to show you her Bible, she's actually worn them out. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? She's worn, worn out her Bible. She has underlined everything that she wanted to remember. She has highlighted particular passages. She's written in the margins. And it, she, you can see years in her Bible of, of chewing over the Word of God. And it's gone really deep. And um, she's tuning into that. I imagine she'll know who she is. But that may be you, too. Or it could be you if you wanted it to be. When I did this with Mark chapter 1, following on from the two video blogs, I found that there were 14 different references and inspirations by the Holy Spirit during Mark chapter 1. Next one, please, Mark. Isn't that incredible? 40 verses at least 14 different references. You might, you might find more. I don't know. But here are just a few. The fulfilling scripture. The enabling um, of, through baptism for us to become fully human. The announcement of God's kingdom. Evangelism. Jesus calling the disciples. Healings. Mark has a lot of healings in his gospel. 
driving out of demons, restoring peace in both people and communities, inspiring and enabling Jesus in his prayer life, and also seeing a bigger picture. Now what I've done is, those are just a few, and then right at the centre is the, the Great Commission to Jesus and his baptism, which we'll come on to in a minute. I've gone through all these um, passages, I've highlighted them for you, and I've put them in the notes for today, um, which will go up with the, all the songs, etc., which Kirsty will kindly post. So if you'd like to look at that, it's right at the end of all the notes for today. And I've put a little explanation um, under each passage, um, just a, a few thoughts as to what it might, how the Holy Spirit might be working through that particular part. I'm just going to fly through very quickly. We won't have time to go through all of it today. But um, I just want to give you a flavour. So right at the beginning, Mark's Gospel opens, strangely not where all the other three Gospels begin, which is with the birth of Jesus. Mark announces Jesus onto the stage of his Gospel at his baptism. There's something Mark's trying to tell us there, through that. He's not trying to say, well, Jesus' birth and his upbringing and everything didn't matter. What he's trying to say is, from this moment, we can see Jesus becoming the person who we should model ourselves around and indeed follow in our lives. And that begins with the great call. The beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah, I will send a messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. We looked, as I said a couple of weeks ago, at the idea that the Holy Spirit has woven, has woven himself through scripture and indeed through the whole of history. He doesn't just appear at Pentecost. That's just one of his many, many appearings. It's one, been one of the great things about doing this 40 days with the Holy Spirit by Jack Levison on the daily blogs. We can see right the way back, the Holy Spirit has been there. And here, the Holy Spirit inspires the book of Mark to write, actually, you know, this is fulfilling scripture. From John the Baptist coming onto the stage to baptize and prepare the way for Jesus is a fulfillment of scripture. Isn't that wonderful? Absolutely amazing. Um, I saw them talking to some young people um, this week about either this is the most incredible and elaborate story ever to be written by humanity, or indeed it's the Word of God, because it's, and I would, as we'll come on to see, I find it hard to believe that it actually is purely a human construct. It has to come from somewhere else, and it comes indeed from God. So we must move on. But the Holy Spirit inspiring scripture and indeed fulfilling scripture. And leading writers hundreds and hundreds of years later to see those connections and indeed to remember them. Secondly, the high will idea of baptism. Baptism in Mark's gospel particularly isn't just about cleansing. That's John's baptism, the forgiveness of sins. It's actually about the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And that infilling enables somebody to be fully themselves. John chapter 10, verse 10. I have come that you may have life, and life to the full. What an amazing and wonderful gift that baptism is to help us to have a, a, another chapter in our lives to discover that we can be fully ourselves. We, we, we've talked about that before, we can talk about it again another time. But we go on. One of the great things of, Mark, of Mark's Gospel is the number of healings that take place and the link between healing and preaching and announcing the Kingdom of God. They go hand in glove. They, 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 they're not separate. Why is that important? Because of the fact that in some ways the Kingdom of God, in a major way the Kingdom of God, is the healing of the whole of creation, the whole of humanity and each individual and each organisation and society within it. And there's a lot we can talk about that, and we have talked about that. But at the same time, healing and announcement coming together, both inspired by the Spirit, 
And throughout Mark chapter 1, there are numerous references to that. And what Jesus then does is he calls people to join in with this movement. Not just to um, appreciate it, not even to sing songs about it and worship that, but actually to join in, be partakers of that. We'll come back to that in a moment. And then lastly, Jesus being inspired to pray. What I, I love about Mark chapter 1 is that in the midst of his immediate popularity, Jesus just takes himself away and spends time on one-on-one -on -one time with God. That can be one of the most difficult things to do, not just because of popularity, but actually being in that space, one-on-one -on -one with God. I know Jesus came from his Father, and so he had a sort of a, a, a head start on this, but for us, it can be the most difficult place. We can we can find it really hard to be in that place where the Holy Spirit can be with us and inspire us both to be there and then support us for however long we can be in that space, holding our breath in the presence of God. And bit by bit it becomes familiar and bit by bit it goes deep. And it's a place that the Spirit calls us to, leads us to and sustains us in. Beautiful. And it's all here in Mark chapter 1. Very lastly, um, there's the story of Jesus healing the leper and uh, then inspire, encouraging the, the leper to go back to um, the priest and actually to go through the purification rite that would have been through what the, the Jewish system had at the time. And um, I love that because it, it would be so easy for Jesus to say, don't you see what I've just done for you? And there's this whole idea that well, Jesus needed to keep himself secret because if he revealed too quickly who he was, then people wouldn't understand. And that's very much a theme of Mark's Gospel. But at the same time, I think there's another strand of this last part of Mark chapter 1, which is about the institutions of the world, and indeed even the church, needing to understand that who is in their midst, someone who is going to bring about change, who is going to inspire and encourage us to all move to a new level as indeed the temple in Jerusalem, the synagogues, they all had an experience of who Jesus is. And they found it really hard to let go. Not only do individuals need to change when they meet with Jesus, but actually organisations and institutions do too. And that includes us as a church, as we journey together. So there we go. That's, that's just a bit of a, a snapshot, an overview of Mark chapter 1. I hope if you have time, maybe read through it. If you the idea of highlighting your Bible is a real sort of, well, I'm not, I, I don't want to go there. Maybe um, take a download off of uh, one of the computer programs like Bible Gateway or whatever. But try, if you can, to spend time doing that. I, I, I can do it with you. I can try and do it even for you. But you won't get it unless you try and give that, just that time. I, I, I think it took me about half an hour, something like that to really wrestle with that passage. And it's been a, a great inspiration to me over this week. So what can we draw from it? The next one, please, mate. Thank you. Right at the center of this passage is Jesus' baptism. And many of us will know that the, at the Jesus' baptism, the Holy Spirit comes down and rests upon Jesus like a dove. We, we looked at that together in one of the blogs this week. But at the same time, there's these wonderful words from Jesus, uh, from God to Jesus. This is my son, whom I love. In you I am well pleased. And there's an intimacy and a connection, connective, connection there, which is beautiful. And it talks about the relationship that we have with God, both as men and women, boys and girls. But actually, that passage is, is full of meaning, back to the idea of scripture being fulfilled. And there's two passages that are being fulfilled here. One is from Psalm 2, and that will come on to that in a moment, and the other is from Isaiah chapter 50, 42, but really it's a passage, 42 to 53. Psalm 2 is related to the anointing of a king, but not just any king, a king in the mind and spirit of King David, known as the shepherd boy king. That's why I put a picture of a shepherd boy and a lamb here. 
Because one of the things that God said to David was, here is someone after my own heart. And David didn't always get it right. He had many ups and downs. You can read a lot about him in 1 Kings and elsewhere. But on the other hand, at his, at his very heart was this passionate and compassionate heart. And he never lost that in certain ways. He nearly lost it and then he recovered it, especially towards the end of his life. And this is an insight into how God sees us. Ultimately, we know a relation with God, both in relationship with one within himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but also a deep desire to be in relationship with us. So it's not surprising also that the whole of humanity, and I would suggest also the whole of humanity and creation, are all interrelated. And it's amazing, because science is, 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 is showing all the evidence for that. As we know more about our natural world and us within it, it's incredible the interconnections that are there. Any of you would like to watch Blue Planet or any of the other David Attenborough programs, it's all there. So a king isn't then meant to be aloof um, and she simply top down. It's meant he's meant to be or she's meant to be someone who will hold the heart of the people, pray for the people, walk with the people, and to enable the people to become fully who they can become. This in strangely is a servant ministry rather than a position of authority. Conversely, then in Isaiah, there's these amazing chapters between Isaiah 42 and Isaiah 53, where there's a, a character who begins in the name of the servant, becomes known as the suffering servant by the time we get to Isaiah 53. And it's almost a foretelling of what Jesus is going to do for us and for the world upon the cross. How could that be? So many hundreds and hundreds of years before. And yet it's there, waiting to be discovered. If you have never had a chance to read Isaiah 53, if you do nothing else this day, then I would encourage you to pick up Isaiah 53 and just read it through to yourself and see what it says to yourself, both for you personally, but also for our times, our age. And what a different approach to leadership that that might look like. So what, what this saying of God to Jesus in baptism is, yes, you are my son, that connection. But at the same time, it's laying down, if you like, a blueprint for what sort of message and indeed journey Jesus himself is going to take. And of course we know it will lead to the cross. But here's the thing, as it speaks to us, it certainly spoke to me this week. It's also the journey of the church. If we're followers of Jesus, we can't be surprised that he also calls us to walk in that way. What does that look like? Next one, please. Mate. So if we take those words of Jesus and we think about things at the moment, and I'm, I'm, I, I have to be provocative for a moment, I, I can't help it in that sense, because one of the big things that's been in the news is about this idea of taking the knee. And you may have your own thoughts about that. But one of the things it seems to me is, for many of the people who have spoken, both celebrities, politicians, and others, religious leaders, I think we possibly misunderstand what it's about. To bend the knee to somebody is actually to give them respect, to give them value, to give them worth. And why would we not want to do that as Christians if we're following the way of Jesus? Jesus, in that sense, bent the knee to the whole world. Now, I don't want to be particularly provocative, but on the other hand, it, we need to see that Jesus offers us a very different way of living. And that way of living isn't about um, safety or security or self-justification or um, about our own importance. It's first and foremost about how we can try 
if we can, to help somebody else. And that might be by giving them respect, at least beginning by giving them respect and therefore bending the knee. Not just as a token gesture, but as a way for us to see. I think that's the thing. It, it's also for us to see that that other person matters to us. Now, you may disagree with me. I respect that. But on the other hand, I, for one, can see that this is possibly a, a, a way of also defining what it means to be a Christian, that we're not just someone who goes to church, but actually someone who sees the world and what's important in the world in a slightly different way. Less controversial, but equally demanding. One of the problems with the, the Jesus image as the suffering servant is that we don't like the idea that love costs. But it does. All love costs, whether it's you make a cup of tea for someone, whether it's you, you um, go out of your way to help them, whatever it might be, however big or small, it will cost you. Because that's what love does. And I put up an image here of both Jesus as the suffering servant, but also and of the food bank. And at one level, of course, they're, they're wildly different, but at the same, they also stand in the same tradition of self self-sacrifice and self-giving love. And whoever that might be for you, I think it's the way the church needs to be, not just during this time of lockdown, but as we emerge from lockdown, because it is to walk the way of Jesus. And what happens is, not only does that help the other person, whoever that might be, or society or community, and I know many of you um, give up your time working in schools, uh, in charity shops, doing all manner of other things. But I think this also changes us and how we see the world. And together with that servant king model from the idea of bending the knee, put those two together and we get the relational, the, the relationship that we're meant to have with both God and indeed the world. And so those words will be said to us. My son, my daughter, whom I love, in you I am well pleased. Now we all may fall short of that. I know I certainly do. Many things during lockdown I wish I could have done different. But at the same time, it is about trusting this deep process that is very countercultural, very different to the way our world seems to want to project, which is to be strong, to be, um, have all the answers, to be able to be very assertive, to do and be the people we want to be, rather than necessarily to serve. So it's not necessarily what's going to be the most popular, but maybe this is what God is saying to us, I think at least, right in the beginning, in Mark chapter 1. Next one, please, Mark. What does that look like for us? Well, as we emerge from lockdown, it could mean that we try and keep going with our quiet time. And that can be really demanding when everything's getting busy again. Back to work, back to school, back to the pub, back to many things, shopping. How do we keep that quiet time? It's only by us placing that as a priority, and that costs us. But it's also that deep place of that relationship that David had with God, and more importantly, Jesus had with God. At the bottom, I don't know whether you can see this on the left-hand side, is St. Francis of Assisi kneeling with the wolf of Gubbio. It's a whole story in itself, the have sermon in itself. But it's a beautiful image of this wolf, which is a creature of great power, being tamed not by force, but by love. And you may wish to look that up on the internet, the wolf, Francis of Assisi and the wolf of Gubbio. I remember a famous talk by, by a Franciscan spiritual writer about these things, and the wolf in Latin and Italian um, actually translates also as, as um, somebody who is a, 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 an imposter or someone who is a, a terrorist or someone who is a, a, a person of anger. Um, very interesting that, but another time. On the right hand side, the reading of scripture. You know, we all love to watch our telly, we all love to watch our box sets or, or whatever. I, I, I'm personally into sailing videos, but I get 
we've got no family for that. Um, but the reality is, it is spending time with Scripture. Yes, we can tune into a, a service like this, or we can do other things, but it's only when we have that one-on-one -on -one time with God's Word and with God Himself, along with our quiet time, that, can, that, that really enables Scripture to come alive within us, or to live off the page. But it's not just about church in the conventional sense. It's also about being out in the community and sharing and putting into practice the love that we've tried to learn within us in these ways. And that involves service. And I'm so grateful to everyone for all their acts of kindness during this time. I've said it quite a few times and I'll carry on saying that. Whether it be caring, caring for creation, picking up litter and doing acts of kindness that way. And the last picture I put up on the right hand side just behind me here is of a conference that's taking place even during this time it's been done virtually this year between women from the Christian tradition and women from the Muslim tradition choosing not to live apart in that sense obviously social distancing this time by using a Zoom meeting but choosing to enter into dialogue with each other and to try and heal some of the great misunderstandings the great hurts that can so easily exist between these two great faiths passionate work, but it will cost in terms of misunderstanding as well as in terms of time and commitment. But at the end of the day, what I would like to say is a way forward for the church, strangely, is the vulnerability of being kind. Can we make that sort of our slogan? Be kind. When it can be so easy for the world to want to just grab all it can because it feels it's missed out and it's lost something. It's going to be a challenge. It's going to be hard. It involves self-sacrifice. It involves perhaps thinking of the other. It involves seeing the perspective of the other rather than just wanting what I want. But at the same time, it may be right at the heart of Mark chapter 1. There for us all the time. So that's it, the, the teaching side of it for today. Um, I hope that's inspired you at least maybe to read Mark chapter 1 sometime, if you possibly can, and um, even to get your highlighter out and see what it says to you. Um, I love it when people do this, and then uh, if you have time to be able to talk and stuff, they, people, people share what it, how it spoke to them. And um, I never cease to be amazed at the wonderful different ways that the Word of God speaks to us. So um, I, I can only encourage you in that. But now we need to come to our agape. Because strangely, right at the heart of um, our faith is the, uh, the idea of sharing and being thankful. And this is uh, what an agape is about. It's not the same as communion in that sense. Communion is slightly different. But on the other hand, at the very heart of it is this idea of thankfulness and sharing. So if you have got some bread, and um, some juice of some sort, water, or I've got some uh, grape juice, and uh, some fruit to remind us of the fruit of the earth, then we're going to come to sharing that now. So if you want to get that together, that would be good. So just a few words um, to lead us into this time of sharing. We are all invited to a common table. We may be in our own homes, wherever we may be, we may be today, but we're all invited to a common table in the throne of heaven to share in an agape feast. At this table we come as brothers and sisters in the family of God to taste and see that the Lord is good. Next one, please, Mark. Thank you. I'd like to share this white words with me. As we share this bread, as we pour out this water, we thank you, God, for our daily bread, for the food which delights and nourishes us, and for the companionship that sustains us. We thank you, too, for water, to quench our thirst, and for the living water with which you surprise and enrich and transform our lives. We give thanks for this feast, at which we are all welcome and can share a foretaste of your heavenly kingdom. Amen.
So what you need to do now is um, take your bread, um, whatever it is, I happen to have some piece of bread here, and uh, if you are on your own, know that you're sharing this with so many other people who are joining in with us today and hopefully will join with us throughout this week. And um, if you're with somebody else, hand the bread around and uh, I'm going to give some to my friend here. There you go, Mike. And, uh, and eat it. Really awkward trying to talk and eat at the same time. So I'll try and do that. Next thing is to take your fruit to remind ourselves it's so easy to go to the supermarket, isn't it? Well, it's not quite so easy, but to see food as just a commodity, something we need to have, without realising and valuing how beautiful and simple and wonderful it all is, and indeed then part of God's provision for us and indeed for the world, will we share it? Do we hold on to it? Do we hoard it? Or do we actually, are we willing to notice and value it and indeed then be willing to share it? So when you've got an apple or a banana, whether you've got some grapes, whether you've got whatever you have, I've got some cherries as I say. I don't know whether Mike likes cherries. Not particularly, but he's taking one anyway. Bless him. I love cherries. Mm. I can't believe I'm spitting the pip out in front of you, but there we go. And then lastly, some water or some juice or whatever you choose to drink. And of course this can be a really powerful image of the Holy Spirit as you take a, a sip or a drink from your drink, whether it be a simple glass of water, whenever you turn that tap on, and you see that as the Holy Spirit as you, as you take a drink, that you're drinking in the Holy Spirit, allowing God's love not just to be held at arm's length in your life, but actually to be part of your life, in, to dwell in your life. And um, we can just want Holy Spirit more, more and more. So, there you go, Mike. Cheers, he says. And um, here's to all of you. Thank you for your faithfulness. Um, and indeed, for some people who are joining us, and for many of you who are joining us, the stories we've heard back about how your faith has grown during this time. Um, it's very humbling that um, it inspires me to grow in my faith, uh, to walk with you as we share together. So thank you. And here's to all of you. Simple things, simple pleasures, but which bring great joy, simple joy. Far bigger than just themselves we choose to see things that way. Let's give thanks together. We say together, living God, bless all who have gathered round this table. May we know the fullness of your presence at every meal and in all our sharing. Amen. Let's uh, bring our service to a close by sharing the Lord's Prayer together. We pray together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And the prayer of blessing that we've used throughout this whole time of, of lockdown. Um, so we'll share it again today. May the Father who so loved the world that he gave his only Son bring each of us by faith to his eternal life. Amen. And may Almighty God bless us and keep us. May his face shine upon us and be gracious to each one of us. May he look kindly upon us 
and bring us always his peace. Amen. So thank you ever so much for joining us. Um, we've put some songs and videos up for you. Um, you can see on the far left, I hope, um, Her Majesty the Queen. Um, there's a, a few little videos we found, I found about her reflecting on her coronation um, some time ago. And um, it just captures her spirit of humility. So that, I put those up for you. On the far right here, um, uh, I've put a couple of videos up from an organisation called One for Israel, which is um, Jewish people, but also increasingly also Arabic people, talking about how they have found the person of Jesus to be the fulfilment of their hopes and dreams. And it's very humbling. They're about five minutes long, um, but often very powerful stories. So uh, a lady there is talking about how Isaiah 53, this suffering servant image and passage, um, really spoke to her and changed her life. In the middle, I've put up two of the uh, famous uh, singer-songwriters, uh, Taya Smith, who is one of the lead singers with Hillsong. Um, I put up a video about how she uh, ended up being a, a singer for one of the worldwide phenomenon in Christian music. Um, and also, the person on the right with the guitar is Graham Kendrick. Um, some of you know that I have a little joke with you about Graham Kendrick, but um, there's a wonderful video um, we put up for today about how what motivates him to write some of these songs and it's a real insight into a humble man who knows and loves his scripture and simply wants to serve the Lord well what more can you ask from that so uh, and then finally the young people very kindly have given me another song um, it's called the 151st Psalm uh, it comes from a film and uh, you might enjoy that as well next one please Mike I just want to say, before we close, a very, very big thank you. Um, last week, I stood here and asked whether people would be kind enough to think about giving a Bible to um, the Year 6 children at uh, St Anne's School and St Andrew's School. Uh, and I was, I was daunted by the numbers that Kaz gave me, which was that we needed, there were 72 children that are leaving this year. We've already surpassed that. That's incredible in a week. So to all of you who have very kindly um, either pledged your money or given your money to Beth um, to do that, that's, that's incredible. And I, I can't thank you enough. I, I really mean that. Uh, I know it will mean a lot to the children and young people. It will mean a lot to the staff in the school um, to know that we have been able to do that. We're actually in conversation with Banwell School. Uh, Percy is very kindly and Kaz is very kindly been speaking to them. And we should know Monday, Tuesday, whether we, they would like us to do something similar, whether with a Bible or with a dictionary. The main thing is that the children know that they're loved um, by their community and indeed by the church. So if you haven't yet given and you would like to give, um, then please, the details um, on the New Creation for News sheets, and I'm sure um, uh, Kirsty can put up some details on the Facebook page if you would like to give to that. Um, if for any reason Banwell can't do it this year for whatever reason, then um, any extra monies that do come in, we will put towards the Bibles for next year. So that would be a specific, specific fund for that. So uh, if you'd like to do that, you're very welcome. And thank you so much. Thank you so much for all that you've done. I can't believe that we've managed to achieve this in a week. Um, phenomenal. Next thing, church. Church is opening for, uh, open for private prayer each day. Thank you to those who are very kindly opening and closing each day and cleaning every day, um, making this possible. Um, I think each church, people are telling me, each church has at least somebody who goes in every day to pray or to just sit and be there. Um, so it's worth it just for one. And uh, obviously some of you will be saying, well, what's happening about public worship? Um, but there's one or two churches that are starting back um, today. We're looking at all the guidelines they've come out this week um, from the National Church and now from the, from the Diocese. Um, please bear with us. We are working through it as quickly as we possibly can and um, are hopefully pretty able to discuss this with the, the two church councils. And once we've come to an agreement as to what we're going to do and a bit of a plan, then um, we'll put that out in all manner of ways um, as soon as we can. 
Um, so look out for that, but at the same time, please bear with us and pray for us that we, we do this. We want to do it safely, we want to do it um, responsibly, and we want to do it in a way that we also um, we can enable people to join in with us because um, we're, we're, we're very humbled by the number of, number of you who are joining in, not just on a Sunday morning, but throughout the week um, with the live stream. It's something we want to, to build into the future. And we just need a bit of time to look at that. So as soon as we can announce something, we will do. So look out for these things. And certainly the church at home coordinators will, I hope, I hope be willing to, to phone around and share with their with their groups about that. Next one, please, Mike. You, over the last couple of weeks, we've had uh, the virtual fete here in Comsbury, and we've had the um, summer fun, the virtual picnic in Banwell. Please don't see these events as now having happened. There's lots of things that are still available um, and will continue to happen over these coming weeks. The Scarecrow Walks, the um, History Walks, all manner of other things. So please look on the Love Comsbury and Love Banwell Facebook pages if you'd like something to do over the, over the next few weeks. And uh, certainly as the summer holidays approaches, um, there's all sorts of things you can involve, be involved in. We're trying really hard, next one please Mike, we're trying really hard to, to keep this idea of a, a short little testimony each week going, so hopefully um, there will be one that will come up um, for this week. Um, we've had one or two glitches last week, but we're, we're trying to do our best on that. And lastly, we're going to have our coffee morning in a moment, so if you'd like to join us for that, Kirsty put up the details of how to do that. I think that's just about it for this week. Um, thank you ever so much for joining us. Um, May God bless you, may he be with you throughout this coming week, and um, yeah, may the Holy Spirit inspire and encourage us to be kind as we look to be the church of the future. God bless. Have a good week. Bye for now.